Hello and well met. This is Founder Leroon with Fantasy Grounds Academy. Today I'm going to go over some basic things that most game masters either miss or have trouble with or don't have understanding of how to use the platform. I'm going to try to help that by showing you some good practices and also some ways to organize your campaign. Now this isn't a fix-all for all campaign settings or rule sets, but generally this will help you in the long run if you follow a certain format each time you start a new campaign. Right now, I am in a new campaign session. It's pretty raw and basic. I went into the setup screen. I chose my rule set for a new campaign. I selected the D&D 5e rule set I added the background here, which is part of the art subscription that comes with Fantasy Grounds. This is called the Wizard's Desk for the theme. And now I'm going to show you how to load your library and how to get started. So without further ado, we'll get going. Um, I just wanted to ensure you that this is not rehearsed or scripted. And there is no agenda here other than to help. This may or may not appeal to everybody. We understand that. What we want to do is try to get the word out. And if you're already familiar with Fantasy Grounds, this may annoy you or it may just be something that would refresh your memory. Nonetheless, we are going to go into how to use Fantasy Grounds to set up your D&D 5e campaign in this case, but it could really be any rule set. As long as you understand where things are at, and that they are partially related throughout all rule sets, especially the ones that are based on the core rule set. So when you're using Fantasy Grounds for, let's say, Pathfinder or one of the other Fantasy rule sets, just keep in mind that they're all based on the core rules. So some of the functionality and the base operations and the UI will be similar throughout. So just be careful and bear in mind that Fantasy Grounds is somewhat universal depending on what you're playing. So here we go. Let's check out the next agenda here. So I want to first show you how to set up your tabletop. And I do this in virtually almost every single video that I've put out. And it's very important. A lot of people get annoyed. Oh, I don't want to see setup again. Well, this is actually one of the reasons why most people will fight with the interface. So first of all, when you first start Fantasy Grounds, you're going to have a setup option. So if I go to the setup, this is what pops up first. And then your chat window is going to be a lot smaller than this or a lot taller and thinner. So that's basically what you start with. So what I want to show you is that there is a method to this and it can make things easier for you. I'm not saying it's going to solve all your problems, but it'll definitely help. So the campaign setting uh, setup here is part of the setup window that comes up when you first start Fantasy Grounds. This is going to take you to the user manuals, the wiki user guides, and the forums. Learn to use those to help yourself when you need help. And you can always come to the Fantasy Grounds Academy as well. We will provide you with the best information that we have, and we will try to assist you. So this is the campaign setup window. I'm going to hit next. Here are the data modules, rule sets that you can load. Now this is assuming that you have at least the player's handbook and some content. If you don't have a license or at least the SRD, some of this stuff isn't going to make any sense to you. But I would definitely load the SRD and the basic rules if you are new to Fantasy Grounds and you just purchased the license and you don't have any books yet. That way you can play around with this, the, the interface and kind of get used to where things are at. That would be my first recommendation. After that, connect to some other people that have campaigns or games or one-shots going so that you can get a feel for Fantasy Grounds and also see if it's going to fit for you. There is a 30-day money-back guarantee if you buy Fantasy Grounds, the license, through the store. If you do it through Steam, I think you only have about an hour to get a refund. 
but if you buy it through the fantasy grounds store you can get a refund back but just keep in mind if you ask for your money back it's also going to cancel your subscription so you can't buy it for 30 days cancel it and then expect to play it for 30 days so they have it set up to where it'll cancel as soon as you cancel your subscription now if you buy the full license you won't have to worry about that so in the campaign setup i'm just going to load the core rules the core rules in fifth edition is considered the player's handbook the monster manual and the dungeon master's guide when you do load these books it does take a few seconds to load it's going through quite a bit of text and it's extrapolating all of the art and the data that comes from the modules so you want to wait a few seconds before you do anything and that way it will load up all the content and you will have less problems and less likely to crash your desktop or have errors a lot of people get very impatient with this i understand it the more content you have in your machine the longer this load up time takes so just keep that in mind when you have a ton of content it does add to the load so that is just a little tip that we have so again i'm using the wizard's background interface that's what this is for um, it's called the wizard's desk and as you can see here the modules have loaded there's the dungeon master's guide there's the dungeon master's player guide which has a few different player options there's the monster manual and the handbook. If you don't own those, then load the SRD and the basic rules. Now, I do not recommend loading 5e all rules. That loads everything in your library that's 5th edition. I don't, uh, I mean, at least the, the core stuff. So I don't recommend that. That's a little hard on your system, especially if you have a lot of people connected. So once you've loaded these, you get the green check mark that basically says, yes, it's loaded. And what this does is it loads these books into your libraries, and this is kind of a shortcut interface. So if I come over to the library view, there are the books that were loaded. Now you can load the books through the library view, but the campaign setup is more of a shortcut. So from the library view, you can go to modules, or you can go to modules in the shortcut menu. Both are the same. So if I click on modules, it will pull up everything that I own, including third-party content that's installed in my modules folder. So I'm going to pick a setting that I want to try out. Or maybe I'll pick a, an adventure module. But if it's anything in the Forgotten Realms, I definitely want the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. If you own it, that's a good thing to have. So you have the Adventures Guide itself. And then there are some maps that come with it that you can load as well. And then there's some player options too. So when you're building characters, you have more content. So the maps, the guide, and the player's guide are broken up into three pieces. And that's to cut down on the memory load. So if you don't need the maps or you don't need the player options, don't load them. So I'm going to go ahead and load them anyways because I want to see what, what kind of content it is. I'm not too worried right now about having anyone connect to the table. So I've loaded all the content potentially in this campaign setting and I'm going to use the Sword Coast Adventures Guide for the maps and for the information. I'm not necessarily going to run anything out of it, but I'm going to use it to help me guide myself through the adventure region where they're going to be adventuring. So now I want to take and back this up and I want to go ahead and maybe I'll do Ream of the Frost Maiden or something a little newer. So let's uh, let's see. I want to do maybe a lot of people like Lost Mind of Fandelver, but I do that a lot. I want to try something different. I'll do the D and D Essentials, or I'll do something D and D related. So let's go with um, you know I'll do the. Let's see what setting should we load? Anybody have any suggestions other than Lost Mind of Fandelver? do a lot of that and it's it I'm sure it gets frustrating because people want to see other stuff so I'm trying to kind of placate the rest of you if you guys have a setting that you're getting ready to run go ahead and uh, let me know which setting you'd like me to load because I have quite a few of I have most of them or if there's a third party module you'd like me to load I could do that too but I have a ton of different things for content here that would help with any game system this is basically just my way of collecting items i've been collecting for three or four years so i'm not expecting you to have all this stuff so it's one of those things 
There's also some solo books if you want to try to run through Fantasy Grounds on your own. There are some solo adventures that you can run that uh, has been put out. They're pretty popular because a lot of people have a tough time keeping a table together. So there's a couple modules in here that are basically put out by third-party content users, such as Cobalt Press. There's some from Frog God Games. There's, there's just tons of different content out there. So if you're interested in running something, think about a theme. So if you're going to have a desert theme, maybe you want to collect content and assets for that. Um, so here I have the Amun Rays Almanac for the Arctic Realms, the Mountain Realms. So maybe if your setting takes place in the forest or under dark, maybe those would be good things for you. It's just a matter of what you need for your campaign and what your requirements are. So I'm going to also load a map pack here. This is from Chris McDermott, Give Game Tile Warehouse. He created this content, and it's a map pack of maps that are already constructed and built. And this goes into a mage school or a mage college, which I think is pretty nice. So I'm going to go ahead and close and load that up. And then, for the sake of an argument, I'm going to go to I'm going to load up Candlekeep. Uh, since I didn't really get too much feedback yet. So I'll go load up Candle Keep, and I'll see what kind of content I have for that. So I have some third-party content, and then I also have some other content in here that was created by the community. So the D&D Candle Keep Mysteries, I'll load that. There's one by Grim Press called Encounters in Candle Keep. So I think I'll load that just so I have more encounters to work with. I may never use them, but I want to look to see what the content has in it. That way I can use it throughout my campaign if I need to. So I go ahead and load that content. And now there's the Candles Keep Tome of Books, Sign of the Dragon. And this is from Rob Tui and his team. So I will load that. And then there's the Elminster Keep, Elminster's Keep Companion. I'll load that just for the sake of it. And then Morden Canaan's Candle Keep Collectibles. So there's quite a bit of uh, content that you can get on the DMs Guild and also from third party sources, such as tokens and maps. So there's some other things that you could load potentially, but I think that's enough content for now. And I also have a map pack, so I'm just going to use that as my maps if I need any. But there are some really nice, beautiful map packs out there. So if you want to get extra maps for this type of thing, then you can certainly find that on the DM skill. So I've loaded enough content. I think this is good for me to start. And as I work through setup, I'll unload some of this content if I don't need it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click Next on the campaign setup. And I'm going to go to the Options menu. And when I'm done with this Setup Wizard, I can hit Finish, and it will dismiss that. Now, if you don't want that to go away, or if you want it to come back, you can click on Setup. And right now, it's called it's set to Show on Load. So every time I load Fantasy Grounds, this will come up. So if I want to keep that from happening, I will go ahead and click Show on Load, and kind of scroll through there and Finish. But if I ever have to go back, I can go through Setup. The next thing I want to do is make sure I have the right view. So on the right hand side, these are the view links for all the different groups or sections that are available within the view I have. So if I go to sidebar, these are all the different things that are loaded that are highlighted in this light blue. So you have game master mode, you have a player mode, and then you have character creation mode. And then you have all, which is a good thing to start with just so you can see what content you have in case. And then if you want to make your own, you can clear it and add your own. So in this case, I'm just going to click Game Master or GM, and that's the default mode that it's loaded in when you first start if you're the host. If you're a player, you'll start in play mode. The difference is, is the options over here on the right. Now, if you level up or you're going to create a character, you want to click on Create PC, and that will give you other options. So I'm going to go ahead and click back on Game Master Mode, and these are the views I have, and you can customize these, you can add stuff to it if you want, or take things away. What it does is it helps keep this menu clean, so you don't get confused and you don't have too many options. 
or it'll provide you a lot of different options. So now that I have that set up, now I'm going to come through here for some house rules. So a lot of times people are wanting to change this background decal. I have added my own, so it's set to custom. But if you want to use the stuff that comes with a theme or a purchase product, you can toggle through these. I just happen to use this one for this particular stream. So another thing you want to consider is the dice tower. Some people don't use it. Some people do. Let me close the library for now. Now in the library, I will bring that back up when it's needed, but I went ahead and closed it for now. So for the table dice tower, if I turn that on, it shows for the clients, the players, but not for me. And that's because when I actually roll this 20 sided die, it's already hidden by default. So I don't have to worry about them seeing the dice rolls unless I want them to. So if you want to use the dice tower as well, and you want to see the visibility of it, you need to turn on chat show GM rolls. If you turn that on, you will get a dice tower on the bottom right corner, provided that your rule set supports that. And now I'm going to right click it and I'm going to unlock it and drag and drop it over here next to the dice so it's more convenient to drag and drop. And then I'm going to right click and lock it. So that locks the position so it no longer can be moved by accident. The next step is I'm going to widen the combat tracker and shrink it a little bit. Excuse me, this is the chat window. The combat tracker is the next piece. So from this, I'm going to right click. I'm going to unlock and you can take the bottom right corner of this particular window and stretch it wherever you want. So in this case, I'm just going to stretch it a little bit wider and I'm going to make it a little bit less so that this will become my standard position where I'm going to have my chat window and I locked it into place. So these are the only two things that you can lock and I think you could unlock the, yeah, you can unlock the position of the modifiers. I don't think you can unlock the dice anymore. You used to be able to in classic. So you can move the modifier box if you want and you can move the dice tower and you can move this, but you, those are the only things you can lock. Everything else is free floating. So now what we want to do is if you want to set up message of the day, so let's say your group is going to join your table, make characters or claim characters. You can drag and drop story entries or links in here. You can type in a welcome message. So I'm just going to type something in here. I just put welcome to the class. And this would assume that I'm teaching a class or something. And when the players come on the table and they go to cl uh, claim their characters, that message pops up. So that used to be a third party extension. Now it is included in Fantasy Grounds. So that is basically the, the most that you probably will deal with initially when you start Fantasy Grounds. I'm not going to mess with the combat too much, but I am going to change a couple house rules. And the only one I might change is the distance that they can move. So later on in the lesson, if we get that far, I will go ahead and change that to probably variant or you can do raw. And what that does is it changes how Fantasy Grounds calculates the movement, depending on your rule set, of course. So that is something I might change. I usually leave it to variant. That way, when they move diagonally, it counts every other square as 10 feet. So they're not moving one and a half times the distance. So that is basically all of the options I will play with at the moment. For now, I think that's a good start. If you want to clear this chat area, you can right click and click on the eraser clear or if you have too much stuff here and you right click and that eraser won't come up there is a command you can do right slash clear and hit enter and it will clear everything so if I have a bunch of text in here and a bunch of dice rolls and all that kind of stuff and I can't right click and I can't get this clear button to come up in the chat window you can just do a right slash clear and that will get rid of everything in the chat window so that's a healthy tip for when you want to clear this. I don't recommend doing it during character creation too much so that the players don't lose what, they, what they're looking at. But any other time, if it gets to be too much of a clutter, you can do that. Fantasy Grounds also logs the session. So when you're in this chat area, anything that's typed or rolled or displayed here will be, will be uh, 
amend it onto an HTML log. It'll be called chatlog.html, and it'll be in your campaign folder on the back end of Fantasy Realms. So you can audit the HTML page that comes out of this. Now the next thing I'm going to do is start looking at the content that we have loaded. So I'm going to go back to library, and this is my shelf. I've already loaded everything on my bookshelf that I want to mess with, and I have the Candlekeep Mysteries, which is the adventure that I want to run. Here's the reference manual. This is what is the actual content or book. So a lot of people complain, oh, I don't want to buy the, you know, the physical copies, or I don't want to buy it again. Well, I agree with you. It's kind of a tough sell to to buy everything two or three times. However, the Fantasy Grounds copy isn't too bad. So if you have a laptop and you collect all the content, you can basically use this as your library and you have this reference manual. The nice things about the reference manual is that it's searchable. So if you wanted to look for something in particular, you can search down here on the bottom left. So then you can also expand all the chapters so you can see what's in the book itself. Or you can collapse it. So if I wanted to go to a book of books, this is going to read out as it would in a PDF or in a hardback book. So if I wanted to look something up, I have the search field on the bottom left. And then I also have the arrow keys at the bottom in which I can turn the page. So this is kind of a reference manual slash book that you can basically set upon people. And then that way that when they need to look something up, if it's shared, such as, excuse me, the player's handbook, the player's handbook will be a very valuable tool so that they can reference things and they can look it up if they have to. So this, in effect, if you share a book, not an adventure so much, but a, a rule book such as the player's handbook, the players will have access to look up and reference things. Now, if you want to take and put something for keeps for later, let's say you want to go to this candle keep section here where it starts. This kind of gives you a outline of what it looks like and, and some of its history. So you can pop this page out, which is a link to a separate page, and you can take this top left link up here, it looks like a dragon in this case. It may change form depending on what rule set and what theme you have. But I'm going to drag and drop and drop that into the hotkeys. The hotkeys are a nice handy way to keep all these things as a shortcut. The other thing you can do is when you close the reference manual and you close this content, you can bring it and recall it back up if needed. So this is a very handy thing. Both the GM and the players can achieve this. All you have to do is single left click and drag the content or the actual link down to this bottom here where all these slots are. And there's more slots than one. You can hit Shift and Alt and Tab and you'll have a ton of other shortcuts. So this is just one usage of Fantasy Grounds that I like. It's got this little shortcut menu on the bottom. You can put anything in there like spells or reference your class or whatever you want to do. It's very handy. So I'm going to close that. So you can have multiple copies of different things. And you can also do die rolls. So if you're going to roll something all the time and you don't want to deal with trying to re-roll it every time, you can take a die and drop it into one of the shortcuts. So there's a D6. So if I single click that, it'll roll a D6. It's no different than dropping it in here. However, you can do dice pools. So I can take more than one dice. Let's say um, 4D6. I can keep dragging these in here. And now when I click on it, it'll roll four dice. Or conversely, you can right click on any dice, select the number of dice you want to pick up. So I'll just pick three and you can drop it. Adjusting. So that is basically one of the nice things about this interface is the dice rolls. You can have some a little bit more complicated ones. So if you want percentile, you right click on the 10 sided dice, you click on percentile, and it'll roll like a percentage dice. Or if you want to just roll 2d10, you just do times 2, it'll add the 2. 
And different rule sets have different roles, so it depends on what rule set you're in. But I'm just showing you the stuff that comes with this particular rule set, which is 5th edition. So the other thing you can do is create multiple dice rolls. So if I wanted a D10 with a D6, I can click on that and it will roll both of those together. So they don't have to be matching dice. You can also roll a three-sided dice. So if you t type the command slash die, which is the command that tells Fantasy Grounds that you want to roll some dice, you just put in one D3, so that'd be a three-sided dice. Well, in reality, that doesn't exist. However, you can roll that. If you want to use this dice over and over and not have to keep retyping it, you can drag and drop the text from this dice field or from this text field and put it into this command area. And now when I click on it, it's going to roll and it only gives you a range of one to three. Unfortunately, it's not going to create the animation or the dice for a three-sided die because it doesn't exist. However, it'll still roll a dice and you will still be able to use an odd numbered uh, table or an odd number roll depending on what you need. So that is just some of the features that the interface gives you within a given rule set. Now, not all rule sets are created equally. Yeah, 4D6, 1. Yeah, so there is that. I like my circles to not be squared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get you. So I'm going to take and do what he said. He can do a dice roll um, command. So this would be basically the old school 4d6 drop the lowest or you can keep the highest three you can do it either way so i'm going to do the command again slash die 4d6 so that's four six-sided dice and then d1 which is drop one so basically i can drag this over to my hotkeys and use that as my default rolling and it automatically drops the lowest number so it knows that to do that so you can do your stats in about six different clicks really fast so there's six different rolls and what you do on your character sheets if you were going to make a character is you can drag and drop those numbers into the field that you want to drag them to so in this case, this is 10, 10, 10, and 10 here. So I might want to drop this 11 in my dex. I'm going to drop the 9 in my intelligence. I'm going to drop the 13 in my strength. I'm going to drop the 15 in my wisdom. And then I will drop, let's see, we got 10, let's see, 9, 10, another 13 we got to work with. So. I'll go with my con. So this might make for a good cleric. But as you can see, you can drag and drop those values in there if you want to. So that is just a, a nice usage of that. The character wizard that comes with Fantasy Grounds will also do that. So if you open up the character sheets and you don't want to make it manually, you want to use the built-in wizard, you can. So if you click the character wizard, it brings us up. This is a fairly new feature. It is still a little bit... Um, rickety, but it's getting better and better every month. Um, this allows you different options without having to commit. So what I mean by commit is when you build a character the old way, such as like this, when you drag and drop different links from different areas, such as your background, race, class, once you do that, you can't go back. You basically have to start over. What this does is it allows you to do all these choices ahead of time before you save it. Once you save it, you're committed, but you can do your race, stats, class, and background before you save it, and you can play with different combinations. If you do the old way, where you drag and drop content onto this abilities area, or you know, in your background, race, and class, and level, what will happen is it, it pulls that information over, but you it's committed. So if you know what you're doing with Fantasy Grounds and you're comfortable with doing the drag and drop, certainly continue to do that. That is that is probably the best way to learn Fantasy Grounds. But if you're in a hurry and you want to build characters quickly, the character wizard is something that you definitely want to try. And if you have standard content and not a bunch of third-party stuff or homebrew stuff, this will work great. 
if you try to use something from the DMs Guild, or if you created a class that isn't quite the right format, this character wizard may not be for you. It cannot basically assume every little if and and but or situation. So you want to use this sparingly if you are basically new. You don't want to assume that this is going to take care of all your third party needs. It has a lot to do with how the things are formatted. Normally from the standard books, the official content, you will get the right combination of things in most cases. We have been reporting um, any types of bugs or anything so if you run into anything that shouldn't be or that's missing, let someone know in the forums and they'll fix it. I mean they, they are actually working on this daily. So this is a, an important tool. And what happened is that the D&D rule set was already developed. So they had to go back and retrofit this to an existing rule set. Whereas Pathfinder had one to begin with and it matured with the rule set. So it was a little easier to tweak it along the way. This one, they're having to go back and retrofit it to an already existing rule set. And the rule set is very complex now. It's not simple anymore. So it is hard to maintain this and every time they add a new book or new content, there is potential that this might have a little bit of problems. But for the most part, I'd say about 85% of the time, this thing works really good. So it's up to you how you want to build characters. But that is something that will come up and plague you if you're not understanding how it works. So that is the character creation stuff. I'm not going to build characters right now. But I'm definitely showing you where they're at and the two different ways to do it. So you can do it manually with the old drag and drop method, or you can use the character wizard. It just depends on your preference and how familiar you are with Fantasy Grounds. So the next thing I'm going to do is take a look at the library again. And we were in the candle keep area. So let's say I don't want to keep coming back to the library. So I'm going to drag and drop this reference manual right to the hotkey. And I'm also going to rename it because it just says reference manual. So I want to put something a little bit more descriptive so that I know it's from the candle keep. So I'm going to hit the edit button and I'm just going to manually type in this candle keep. I'll put CK reference manual. That way I don't have to worry about it. And when I pop this up, it's going to bring up the reference manual or the actual book. So that's really handy to have that. And then this little shortcut here, if I don't want a shortcut or need to get rid of it, you just right click, click on the little clear slot, and that gets rid of what's there. So if you don't want a bunch of stuff there, or you're done using these, you can right click, click on the skull and crossbones or whatever the symbol is and clear it out. So that's up to you how you want to handle that. So the next thing is what is in this module that I need? So if I go to the interface, I want to bring up the images and maps because this is your visual components. These are your handouts, these are your maps, these are your pictures of your NPCs, those sort of things. Then I want the story entry, which is basically the heart of everything. All the different aspects of the game are linked to the story entry and to the images. So these are probably your two main areas. And then you have NPCs. So that's your non-playing characters. That is traps. That is um, your like animal companions. These could also be vehicles. And it can be monsters. So that's what is in the NPCs area. Now, when you have NPCs for Fantasy Grounds, an easier way to organize things and distribute experience points and to set up like more than one uh, NPC are the encounters. So the encounters allow you to drag and drop the NPCs into a group and what you can manage and you can pin it to a map or you can pin it to a story entry. It just depends on what you need. So your encounters are made of NPCs or traps or vehicles or whatever. Now for your items, this is everything but coins because coins are just numeric values in Fantasy Grounds. They're not physical objects unless you create something called coin. So if you go to the items, this is your next group of things. And that'll go over here. And this is everything, your armor, weapons, treasure, anything like that that's coins or stones or you know anything like that. 
And then you have, of course, your parcels, which is another way of saying like a bag of treasure or a bag of um, items. So I think treasure chest would have been a better word for it, but that's just me. It might be called something else in different uh, different settings. It might be called loot, but parcels is what they chose to designate for that particular thing. So it's like a group of treasure. So you have coins on the left and items on the right, and it can be made up of one or the other. So that's just a a approach that you can use to understanding what content you have by bringing these out. When you play, you're normally not having all these out. You're just trying to get familiar with what's there. So in this case, I'm going to also bring out the tables, which adds a way to generate content or to roll randomly for different events or maybe a rumor table. And then you also have quest items. These are your milestones, your goals, the things you want to complete in an adventure that are not combat related. So what I'm going to do is now filter each one of these groups. So up here on the top, I'm going to go to encounter or the this uh, encounters in Candlekeep, NPCs, D and D Candlekeep mysteries. This is the included monsters in the actual campaign. If you have it on set to all, that's everything you have in your library. So basically, it's showing everything. So if you want to concentrate and filter just to this particular module, you can filter it to there, and it will give you just the content that's in the module. I'm going to do the same thing for the rest of these. So there are some artworks in here for the different content. So I'm going to go to the D&D. &D, let's see. Candlekeep Mysteries, this is the, the DM maps for the Game Master. There might be a player's, let's see, magic items, maps. Okay, there's Candlekeep Collectibles. There's the NPC's uh, pictures. And then there's the player maps for Candlekeep. So you have different maps here. So I'll take a look at the player's maps. Um, also for items... There is a drop down filter. So here's Encounters in Candle Keep. That's all the stuff that's included in the book. Same thing with the parcels. Sometimes these are broken down into two different chapters or two different groups, depending on how big the setting is and how much content there is. And here's chapter zero or the beginning of Candlekeep Mysteries. And here are some tables that you can use. So here's the D&D Candlekeep Mysteries. And then there are no quest items. I'm surprised. So most settings have all of these or some of them. In this case, there are no quest items in this particular module so it's all either experience based or the dm decides when they want to level people up so the quest items are another way to give people experience without fighting or without combat so that's that's why that's there but this is your layout of all your different aspects of a campaign now this does include all the character stuff so characters are different in the way fantasy grounds handles it it's another set of data you have backgrounds, races, class, spells, that sort of thing. This is just the module content. So for building characters, it's almost a separate thing. So it just depends on what your what your uh, rule set gives you and what's exactly included. So that is basically what is in a module usually. And like I said, you may or may not have all these categories depending. So now that I have this kind of figured out in a way, I'm going to close these windows. I don't really need them all right now. And technically what I'm going to do is start with the story entry and I'm going to make myself a little run list. This makes it much simpler to run a campaign. Even though it takes a little bit more time, it's actually well worth the effort. 
So first of all, I want to establish a calendar. So right now I don't have an active calendar. Fantasy Grounds has some included calendars. And yes, you can make your own calendars, but that's another topic. But I'm going to go ahead and click Modules. And I'm going to look for the calendar because it is, it's a Fantasy Grounds module. It's not a extension, but it it has a, a kind of a different function. So there is the this comes with Fantasy Grounds Unit. So you click Load, and what you'll see is this population of different calendars for different settings. You have one for Traveler, Starfinder, whatever. So I'm going to use the regular Gregorian one, which is what we use in real life, to help me organize my games. You could use one of the setting calendars so that it will make it easier for you to keep track of in-game events. But once you select a calendar, you're pretty much stuck with it. So unless you restart the campaign, you have to stay with the calendar that you're with. So first I'm going to set the year. So it's 2021. And when I click and hit tab, it's going to automatically shuffle all these dates to where it actually is in real life. The era, I'm going to put AD, and that will select the era. I don't know if that's as critical or not. And once I do that, I'm going to go to today, which is August 23rd, maybe the 24th if you're overseas. or So today is the 23rd. So I'm going to double click on Monday, and that brings up a journal entry. Now I'm going to use this later, but I just started my first journal entry. And then I can set the time by clicking inside of the hour wheel, holding down the right control key, and using the mouse wheel to scroll through the hour. So I'm going backwards to 1 p.m. And then I'm going to change it to 1.30. That's when we're going to get together. So 1.30 p.m. Monday. And then once you have that set, you click on this little set calendar and that will set the day and the time and it also you have an entry here for this day if you advance this clock forward it will actually advance the calendar too so just be, be aware of that so now that I have this this is going to be my journal entry for this particular session now for content up here I'm going to make a list so that I can run the game at least for the first session so I'm going to go ahead and Leave these here for a moment. I'm going to bring up the story, which is basically where everything is stored for all the campaigns and the links. And that's over here on the left. I'm going to drop down, and you'll notice you get these little menus. So I'm going to make a category or a new section, and I'm going to call it Candle Keep Something so I have my own little group to keep track of my own stuff. So it, it holds, it basically calls it group one or group two. And I want to edit that. So once I have it selected, I'll hit edit. And then I'm going to change it to candle. Uh, actually, I'm not going to do candle keep. I'll say my candle keep. That way it doesn't get mixed in with all the others. I just called it my candle keep stuff. And now when I go down alphabetically, I can look at this and go, okay, here's all the chapters in the book, but I want this one, which is my candle keep stuff. And this is a, just a group. Now I'm going to hit this plus button, and that adds a new story to this group. And I'm just going to call it campaign notes. And the reason I'm doing this is if I want to run this campaign again, I'll have my notes saved and I can export them later on. So if I want to run this for a different group of people, I can set up a fresh campaign, but I'll have all my notes left over from the last one. So that way I don't have to play in the same campaign every time. Although that might be easier. So campaign notes. And in this campaign notes, I'm going to drag and drop that into the calendar or the journal entry. Because that's basically linked to this story entry. And then I'm going to take this the calendar entry, and I'm going to drag and drop that into my campaign notes. So that's campaign notes, and then it's going to have my information there. So this is my shortcut to the actual story entry and to the actual journal entry, 
and to the calendar. So it's very handy, this, this kind of like little circle of back and forth that it helps you organize your campaign and keeps you kind of squared away. And I'm going to hit uh, enter and you'll notice that it will create this little link. So to get rid of that, you want to hit control one, which changes this line back to regular text. Because before it was actually still on link. And when you hit enter, it carries over the properties of the line ahead of it. So hitting control one will change it back to regular text. And that is also one of the six text commands that comes in Fantasy Grounds. You have control one through six for different types of formatting. So now that I have my notes here, I would take anything from the story entries that I want to look at. So here's the credits. Here's some content here of all the different chapters. So I might link that just to have a quick shortcut. So that's handy to have that. And then I'm going to go to the next group, which is the a book of books. And this is all the reading that I probably need to do. So I will drag and drop this stuff as I need it into this shortcut area. So I'm going to this is the stuff I need to read for the campaign. So I'm just dragging and dropping this stuff so that I can, you know, go through this. So there's running adventures. You may not even need some of this. So this may just be reference for you. So you might not even need that. But then there's this about the, the fantasy grounds, or excuse me, the uh, Forgotten Realms. And when you open this up, this has a description of this particular setting. So there's this would be my session zero notes. And then I would go to candle keep and open this up and maybe this will be where I actually start playing so there's some a handout that's really nice so I might put that in my links here to make it more quicker for me to access this I might take this candle keep um, section here and link that so all I'm doing is I'm going to basically just set up or drag over the content that I want to deal with for this session. Now, if you go off the rails, you could still do that, but I'm just going to go ahead and just kind of look at this and say, oh, okay. And I will take these and I will use them as reference for my session zero. So campaign notes, session zero is what I'll call it. And that's basically for me. And then if I ever want to export these, I have my own group and I can keep them in there. So this is all the reading I'm going to do. Then I might link some maps here. So maybe I have some fancy maps of the keep itself. Maybe some third party content. Really depends. So basically that's what I do to, to set up the campaign. And if I have any player data, I might put that down here. And that makes this a little easier to run when you have some notes and some reference to go to instead of just scrolling up and down the list here and, and, and getting all confused. So this is all I need right now is um, I'll go back to the story entry and it, like I said I'm going to go to my candle keep stuff and then I can bring up my campaign notes. So this is only for session zero. I do the same thing for session one. So I can drag and drop this and put it in the hotkeys. So when I come back to Fantasy Grounds, all I have to do is pop this up, put it in a good place where I can read it, and go from there. That's how you would basically start up if, if you left the, the session. And then, of course, you can set up your combat tracker, which would be up and over top here. doesn't have to be, but that's where I usually put it. And then on the very top left is where the players connect. And then another thing I would do is take a look at the... Basically, this would be the section where all the overview is, so the party sheet. So once all the players are built, you put them on the combat tracker, then you can put them on the party sheet. And that gives you an overview as the game master. The party sheet gives you the main tab, which is an overview. You have an inventory tab where you manage inventory going in and out and also coins. And also your loot gets awarded here. You have a group page where you can manage your group as to the watch order and also what number they are. You can use this grid here. So if you right click on it and click layers, 
you can actually put a grid on this and just single left click and once you've done that it will draw the let's see if I can get this to come back up but usually if you're zoom too far in or too far out that's basically what causes that so you can use that as a way to place on um, things on your maps and stuff if you don't have any you can use this as a way to to uh, create that so it just depends on what you want to do but this is a way to keep track of things and then of course you have your XP area where you can award for encounters and for the quest items which was your non-combat and goal orientation and, and milestones so that's basically the majority of what you have to do with fantasy grounds you don't have to have a ton of windows open and a matter of fact if you're gonna have a map I'm gonna go to the map module that I created the reason I picked this is because it actually has assets that would work well with candle keep so if I go to my images I have a group here of maps that come with candle keep so here's a map of candle keep so you could share this with your party they will not see the red pins so this here is the official map that comes with the module when you unlock this you can change things around if you right click it you can recenter it so I might make this window a little bit more rectangular and less square and that might help fit the area better and then just kind of shrink this a little bit and then that way it will sit nicely up in this corner and if you want this map to be part of your setup notes bring up your story campaign for the session zero notes unlock it drag and drop this over here and then this will be an image that you would share with your group when you first start provided that you're in this area you might just use it for a DM reference but if you want to share it you right click on the top left corner click sharing and then you can stop sharing the record or you can click share record and what that does is it pushes it out to the players so that is something you'll get used to doing as you learn how to play fantasy grounds now um, that you have your map now I might want to grab something that's a little more customized to the session I'm gonna run depending on what's going on so if I go to the images again and instead of being in the candle keep mysteries I'm gonna go to a third-party map pack this was the meander stuff that that Chris made so there is a group of maps that are in this particular pack and there's these little convenient thumbnails so you can take a look at these so there's some towers there's a gem cave here's a library so this is why I selected this because it has a college a library places of learning so I'm gonna go ahead and open up this library and click on the link and it brings up the actual map now that I have the map, I'm going to stretch this out to about where I want it to display. Because I have to leave room for other things. So I'm going to go ahead and just set it there. Then I'm going to unlock it, right click, and I can expand it out by clicking view and zoom to fill or zoom to fit. Or I can make this just a little bit bigger. I think I'll do that. And then I'll bring it out. And then you can also use this little drop down toolbar and click zoom to fit and it will recenter so if you're all the way zoomed in like this and you don't want to keep zooming out just click this zoom to fit and it'll set it right back into where you had it so the next biggest thing that you want to do is this map has no grid on it the ones that come with the candle keep mysteries already have grids and stuff on them this one does not this is a, a third party um, object but I want to use this map in candle keep to represent an encounter so maybe there's an attack in the library or maybe an assassination attempt it's hard to say nonetheless I'm going to put a grid on this so you want to scale the grid according to the grid size that was given to you within a given module so Chris usually makes these a certain size but between 50 and 60 should be good and these are windows and this kind of rainbow like and stuff is from the windows themselves and then there's some entrances from each one of these areas as well so you can say that these are doors or windows it's up to you so I'm gonna go ahead and take this and put a grid on it so to make this a little easier to work with I will expand this out a little bit 
And you do that by dragging the bottom right corner and expanding out this window. Once you've done that, click the zoom to fit and there you go. So what I'm going to do now is click on the grid and I'm going to click the visibility and see where we're at. So it fits pretty good at 50. If you look at these corners, it's lined up pretty well. Once you notice that it's centered and it's not too bad, if 50 is what you want, then you just go ahead and lock the image. It's already locked, but you can unlock it too. And then go from there. So maybe you don't want that color grid. Maybe this gray is a little much. Or maybe you want to see it a little bit better. So you go to the tint. You can change it. I'm going to go to a, like a light blue color. And I can bump up the transparency or how bright it is. So I might go in about the middle and hit OK. And now you have your grid. Now if you want to change it to theme it to this color of the map, you can click tint. With the color picker, which is this little eyedropper, you can click on that and hover over. So maybe you want the grid to match some of this rainbow effect. So you can click on here and hit OK and it'll take on the hue or the color of whatever you chose. So you can theme the, the uh, grid a little bit. And if you think that's too obnoxious, then you can actually go in and turn it down a little bit so that it's not so bright and it's still visible. So that's basically the most important part. Putting line of sight and adding the shadowing and all that stuff is another process that you'll have to get used to. But just to get started to have things working and out of the box, this is all you have to do. You just go in here, you put a grid on, whatever the image is, and it doesn't always have to be a map. It could be anything you want, just as long as it plays into what your table needs. So I think that's going to be a good start as to how you would use Fantasy Grounds. But it says it realized me forever to take to realize trackpads are iffy with image manipulation. Bought a Bluetooth mouse to get a middle click to drag. Yes, of course. So what he's saying is he had a trackpad or some kind of laptop. And if you middle click and hold down, now you don't want to click on a token or a character, but anywhere on the map, if you hold down the middle mouse and you drag, you can move this around rather quickly instead of using this little navigation window. Another thing you can do is when you're clicking on assets within this, you can actually manipulate where the location is. So you can add more content to this. You can add lighting, whatever you want to do. So I think that's going to be it for now. I think next time I come on, I'll add the lighting to the map. So I already have this map bookmarked, I think. So I want to double check. No, that was the candle keep. So I'll open up my campaign notes. I'm going to link this map to this list. So take this, drag and drop. And now when I come back, it's going to be easier for me to find it. And I'm not going to be digging around looking for it. So I unlock my notes here, drag and drop this this here, and that'll bring up this image later. And I'm going to go ahead and lock this for now. So when I want to come back to it and work on it some more, it's in my run list. So when I first come into Fantasy Grounds, that's what I'm going to see. And then I can come to my story campaign. And if I want to work on that map again, I just click on there. And there we go. So that's a quick way to get to your notes. Another thing that you can do that's kind of handy, you won't have to do this very often, but if you have a map like this and you want to refer to something such as these notes or a story entry, you can drag and drop this link here onto the map. So when you are in the map itself and you want to bring up your notes, you just click up here and that brings it up to the top. It's a little easier than coming all the way down here and dragging from the toolbar. So that, that is just a, a quick tip. And you can link things back and forth to make things searchable and much easier for you. And if you had another map that was related to this, there is another set of maps in that images folder. Let's say you wanted to, I'm going to go back to this folder here. Let's say you wanted to have one of these connect to the other. So here's another part of the library that I might use. And then you could technically pin this to this map. So let's say that these doors down here, these maps are made this way so that they connect. So I can take this and I can pin this on the map itself. So if I want to go to this map and I'm done, let's say I accidentally close it, 
if I open this up, that'll take me to the next map. And I can do the same if I wanted this map to connect over here to this library. I can also link it here, but I have to unlock it first. And definitely I'd want to put a grid and all that stuff on there first too. But I'm just going to do this really quick. So I just take this and drag this over. And now you have a link directly to this map. So that's one way you can do it. If you wanted to do it more manual before you put on your line of sight, if you wanted to make this map a little bigger, you can take an asset like that instead of using this as a uh, separate maps, you can actually connect them as tiles. So if you have the tile version, you can come through here and take these and connect them within Fantasy Grounds. So if I go to Assets, and then I go to this Arcanum, whatever this thing is, I can search for it. I'll look for images, and I'll just go to Arcanum. Oh, that's not what I wanted. So I'll just say library. That might be a good search term. So library would be helpful too. So if I go to library and I will pick something that a keyword that will help me search this better. So library. So right now it's thinking. Okay, so here are some of the other pieces of the library. So rather than adding these as separate maps, I could technically add this as a tile to this particular map. So if I open this up, that brings me to the map tools. Then I go to the layers tab, which is up here, and I'll drag and drop one of these tiles. So this is the map I'm starting with. I want to go with some of the other libraries. So I'm going to go with this, uh, this map here. It's a little different. And that is a tile. And it's set up as 27 by 18. So we'll see what it looks like. So once I have that in there, I can orientate it the way I want. So if I want it to go the other way, the other direction, that would be something you do now. And I'm going to go ahead and, dra and click on this map and see where it lands. So there we go. So this is this may not be what, the way you want it. So if that's the case, you need to select and go to the selection mode. And then select the actual map that you want to manipulate. And then you use these rotation arrows to rotate it. And there you go. And now I'm going to take and drag and drop this and connect it with the other map somehow. So maybe this is what you want. So this thing is semi-modular, but they might not be scaled to, to the way you want. So you might have to do a little finagling, but basically that's how this thing is set up. And these could actually be walkways. They don't have to be doors or anything necessarily. And the other thing is I flipped it around, so that might have changed the orientation. So if I, that's the case, I can rotate it by making sure I'm on that layer and I'm going to rotate the map and see if that helps. It looks like it did. So the way I rotated it the first time was not quite the way that it should have been rotated. So this is this fits easier than the other. And then if you want to move it at all, you can click on the layer and you can have it snap to grid like this. And it will be snapped to grid. So there now you have an expanded library. And you can connect these together modular. That's how these maps were created. Most maps are just single one-offs, but there are some that are made to be connected. And that's how Chris made these. So if you wanted to add another map, we could do the same thing. I'm in the tile uh, layers mode. I'll grab and drag and drop this into the tile area. It's still 27 by 18, so it's that's the number of squares. And I'm going to click here, and there's the other. So if I go to the selection mode, then I'm going to move it over and meet them up. So there we go. There's another part of the library. And you could keep repeating this process. So maybe I will find something that's a little more interesting. Here is a place where they can, a reading room. So again, drag and drop that up here into the tile area. Click on the map. And then I will make sure it's selected and I'm going to layer selection. If you click again, it's going to draw another map. You don't want that. So you need to make sure that you're in the selection tool. So there you go. There's the massive library. 
Now, if you wanted to organize all these, I'm going to add a folder, which is down at the bottom here, and I'm going to rename this folder as library. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to group these together. So I'm going to group them together as one big image. And now that they're in this library like this, I can take this entire map and move it. I have to unlock them though. If you have one that's unlocked and one that isn't, you can't move it. Now I can move it as a whole. I do. I did lose my pins though. But nonetheless, that is how you use this. So that is a way to expand your maps like using tiles or you can use them as individual maps and link them together. So let's just say you want to add a statue. So there's a statue here. I'm going to place it somewhere in the reading area. And it's actually a sentry. So if anyone gets attacked, these these soldiers are going to come to life and, and, and defend the college or the, or the library. So what I'm going to do here is find a place to put these and again, I'm going to drag this asset over and drop it into the tile area. And now if I want to change its orientation, I just click this and it, it will change the way it's rotated. Right now it says it's 10 by 8, so that's huge. I want it like 5 by 5 or you know something like that. So I'm just going to go with 5. Excuse me, 1 by 1 is better. So it's 1.2 by 1. So now when I put that down here, I want to click where it's going to be facing the right way. So I will face this. I'll put this in the corner somewhere or maybe in one of the other rooms. So let's see what we got. Yeah, so let's put it here. So I'm going to click here. And as you can see, it's facing the wrong way. So if you want to rotate that, you don't click here again. You click the layer selection. Make sure you're clicked on the actual layer itself and then you rotate it and now you have a, a more of a feasible appearance here so there and then it's holding like some kind of torch or some kind of sconce so we might do something about that but there's there's the uh and i'll lock it and now you can't move it and then i'm going to drag it into the library now the reason it disappeared because it's underneath other tiles so i need to bring this and drag it up to the top and now it will be appeared so all the tiles are sitting on top of it so that is how you would add an asset and now I'm gonna add a little lighting to it so if I wanted to add a torch or something like that I could so if I go to the actual lighting tool and I pick this light bulb here now I can assign a light so right now I just clicked on it it just assigned a light that doesn't have any properties to it. So it's a generic light, which is fine. And then if you want to move it for some reason, I'm going to go ahead and click on here, what I mean up here in the menu, and I'm going to select the light and move it to the actual brazier. And there we go. And it's also a part of this asset. So the light is connected to this asset. And it's in the library too. So it's not a separate thing, it's, it's connected to this asset. So that's how you would turn on or off the light. So now I want to pick a color for it, I think. So I'm going to go with this kind of light blue color. And I'll turn down the opacity just a touch and hit OK. And then for the preset type, I think I'm going to go ahead and go with a torch. Actually candle, because it doesn't make as much of a and see it changed the color because I I hadn't selected it beforehand so now I'm gonna go ahead and redo that and hit this and hit OK or maybe you want it to match the color that's inside this bowl because there's some blue in here so if you wanted to do that you can click here and you can find something that's closer and hit OK so when that light works it's gonna actually uh, pulse or whatever you want to do so I'm gonna change it to pulse and then um, I'm going to change the speed down lower so it doesn't flash like a strobe light. And then I'll have to go to, I'm going to lock the map temporarily, scroll back out so we can see what we're doing here. And now what I'm going to do is enable line of sight and all that so that this effect comes comes to life. So I'm going to unlock this. I'm going to zoom to fit or zoom to fill, whatever you want. 
and here's the statue. And then what I'm going to do is take and go to the play mode, and you want to enable all this different stuff here. And that's the light, basically, that's coming off the statue. And the reason it's so dark is because I have player vision on, so I don't have any players on the map. So that's basically how you would add something kind of cool like that. And it's all in the library, too. So when you're done, you can lock it and nothing gets moved around. And you can move the library as a whole, which is really cool. Everything will move together, except for the links. Now that's kind of cool is you can turn on or turn off the player vision and just get kind of the DM view of what's going on. here. So you can still see the light, but not as not as much. But you can get an overview of the map. If you want to see what the players want to see, you can hit Control P, and that'll give you a temporary preview. Or conversely, you can run your game like this, and when you need to see the whole map, just hit Control P, and that gives you your vision. So that's about as far as I want to go with the map tools. It's a whole other lesson, but I gave you a little bonus there. Hopefully that helps a little bit in getting an understanding of how to use some of these assets. And that's really all it is, is playing around with it and getting familiar. So that is about it for tonight. I'm going to go. I think I've rambled for too long, and I think people will get upset with me if they watch this in the future. But take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'm definitely going to start doing more of these, just kind of noodling around and showing how these things work, because that's where most people need the help the most, is they just need to know how it works, and that's what I'm going to do. So take care, everybody. Have a good night.